it's a it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Oliver. Uh, Oliver is a person that we've been stalking for a while, <laughs> right? uh, since we kind of became interested in brain, and uh, it turns out that the only brain that is useful to a network scientist is the C. elegans. And when it comes to C. elegans, then the top expert in the world who knows everything about the brain of C. elegans is Oliver. And I think it was Ed Boyden who pointed that out to us, you know, and then since then we've been trying to get on his agenda, and it's a real pleasure to have him today. And, and uh, so Oliver has been done his undergraduate and PhD studies in Germany with the Max Planck Institute, and then he came to US and, uh, and uh, you know, he did the no more route, becoming assistant associate full professor, and now, of course, he's a, he's a Howard Hughes uh, uh, investigator, which all of you with the more medical blend know what, how important that is and how prestigious that is. And, uh, but most important, what is really important, he's really done a huge amount of work of clarifying the, the, the relationship between the genetics of the C. elegans and the wiring of the C. elegans and, and the communication system of the, uh, of between the neurons and how is the brain genetically defined. So all of us who are trying to kind of get to, uh, trying to get into this game of understanding the wiring of brains, his papers are very inspirational. So we're going to hopefully learn more about it, right? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here. It's a really an amazing place. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of James Bond movies. You know, you're the good guys. Wait till the end. Mysterious <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I want to tell you today uh, about um, our efforts to uh, understand the nervous system of sea elegans. And I uh, want to uh, relate to you uh, that. Um, uh, our um, ambitious goal is to really understand how the entire nervous system of an organism is uh, assembled. We can do that in C. elegans because it has a limited number of cells. Um, and um, we want to understand how each one of the individual cells in the nervous system acquire their unique identity that makes them different from one another. And then how these cells um, assemble into uh, circuitry. And uh, is there a laser and what do you need a pointer or a pen? Actually, I have a little difficult this, tell it, Just use your finger or okay, the mouse. Great. Or the mouse. No, 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 that's fine. It's perfect. Uh, to, uh, uh, how these individual neurons then assemble into circuitry. Uh, and I want to tell you today about our work that we have done so far. There's going to be a lot of, uh, I know you'll appreciate lots of uh, schematics, relatively little uh, experimental detail, <laughs> even though at the beginning I will take you through the overall idea of how we do uh, how we arrive at our conclusions. <clears throat> so I want to remind you also um, of uh, a piece of ground truth uh, that um, hopefully is ground truth. I mean, the ground truth that definitely exists that C. elegans has only 302 neurons. The somewhat more questionable uh, point is uh, the classification of neurons into individual types. The conventional wi wisdom <clears throat> is that these 302 neurons can be grouped into 118 different classes based on anatomical features alone. Uh, uh, whether those can then be further subdivided is a, is, a, is a matter of discussion. And, and uh, Lazo's group has, of course, uh, with their recent paper, uh, provided some insights into how cells that look very similar to one another can actually have very different functions. But I won't go into these details today and really just talk about uh, individual neuron classes. OK, in the way. Um, we view that problem of uh, neuronal classification and, and neuronal development, we view that at the end of the day as being a gene regulatory problem. Right? It's boiling down to a very simple, everything is boiling down to a very similar, simple question when you think about a neuronal identity and actually also connectivity, which is different neurons in the nervous system that have different features, functional features, connectivity features, need to express different genes. In other words, <coughs> uh, uh, a very simple way to, uh, to conceptualize this problem here is, again, every individual neuron type has distinct sets of genes that define individual neuronal properties. And it's this combination of genes that give unique cells their unique phenotypes. Right? I do want to point out that uh, uh, viewing the problem of the generation of neuronal diversity from such a bottom-up angle 
is somewhat unusual because historically the developmental neurobiology community has come from sort of more, uh, you know, sort of more uh, um, top-down approach where people have asked, you know, in the developing embryo, how do patterns arise and so forth and so on. While we look strictly at the adult nervous system and we ask, how do these adult features, how are they genetically <coughs> Okay, so I want to take you, uh, this is sort of the first couple of slides with some real um, experiments to uh, how we are addressing this problem of how to define individual neural types genetically. And then, of course, about the gene regulatory mechanisms that bring about these neural type specific combinatorial codes of these effector or structural genes that define uh, neural function connectivity. Yes. Uh, has this genome been uh, determined? Uh, if so, how many genes are in it? And uh, have they all been identified with these other topics? Have they all been? Identified. Yes, so Sierragin was the first genome that was uh, completely sequenced. Uh, it has uh, roughly the same number of uh, genes than, uh, uh, than any other, other, other metazoan genome. Uh, it's about 17,000 genes or so. Uh, flies have a little bit less, uh, uh, vertebrates a little bit more, but not that much more. <clears throat> so we know the genome, uh, we know it's deeply conserved. Um, this is sort of the, the uh, uh, Ford Model T compared to a Porsche. Uh, you know, all the basic stuff is there, it just doesn't have all the fancy stuff, right? <clears throat> Uh, in terms of transcriptome, in terms of what genes are expressed in what cell, this is what I want to tell you about. So, uh, <clears throat> the ultimate way to, of course, get at the molecular signature of an individual cell in any organism is to sort out the individual cell and uh, uh, um, isolate the cell and do whatever type of technology uh, you have available to determine all of the genes expressed in that cell type. So we did this many years ago, and we compared uh, the uh, transcriptome of one neuron type to the uh, transcriptome of, of another neuron type, and of course we compared those two in order to subtract away everything uh, that is not specific to an individual neuron type. And doing that, <coughs> more than a thousand genes that are differentially expressed between two neurons that are actually quite similar to one another overall uh, morphologically, but nevertheless, molecularly very distinct from one another. And uh, different chemoreceptors, different ion channels, lots of interesting stuff here. <clears throat> but the number I want to uh, um, emphasize to you here is this number. There's almost 70 transcription factors expressed differentially between these two neuron types, right? And transcription factors are, of course, the cause of any differential gene expression. And if you see that in an adult neuron, there are dozens of differentially expressed transcription factors, there's surely many ways how you could envision how this differential gene expression is being brought about. And I want to discuss this with you on the next slide. I just want to point out here, with these reporter transgenes that visualize the expression of individual genes here, that what I'm showing you here schematically very nicely pans out here, meaning there's very few genes that are uniquely expressed in one neuron type and nowhere else. These genes here as examples are expressed in many different neuron types. But again, you get neuron type specific unique combinations. Okay? This is what my entire talk is going to be about. Unique combinations of effector genes and, uh, and eventually transcription factors. Okay, so again, we want to understand <coughs> how uh, individual neurons acquire their identity. We want to understand the regulatory mechanisms, so we want to understand what are the transcription factors that define those two different expression profiles, and eventually the expression profiles of all neurons in the nervous system. Yes? Sorry, not totally stupid in the ones of the I don't know, but uh, do we, I mean, by focus on transcription factors and transcription as opposed to actual proteins, you know, eventual proteins, we're ignoring, um, you know, things like, uh, SIRNAs, you know, things totally like that. Totally right. Any type of post transcription right. uh, gene regulation is totally ignored. So we're really just looking at the, at the, the first layer of regulation of the functional set of proteins in the cell. It's absolutely true. And we have reason to believe that this will be enough from your results to, to, to really distinguish the phenotype. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I can tell you that based on transcription alone, uh, we're very optimistic to say that yes, every single neuron in the nervous system will be distinguished from one another by differential transcription. Right, so at first pass, yes. But again, I want to emphasize that this is really just one layer, and there are uh, presumably more layers superimposed onto that that further diversify uh, uh, eventually the proteome of two different neurons. Okay, so let's let's think about uh, how this revelation could occur. <clears throat> again, we have these many different uh, uh, identity features of a, of, a, of a mature neuron, um, including the molecules that specify for example synaptic connectivity. And you could, uh, uh, at you know, first pass at least, think about two fundamentally different ways how these distinct identity features of a neuron come into <coughs> existence. There could be, for every single aspect of the phenotype of a neuron, there could be different transcription factors or different regulatory routines, whatever you want to call it, that individually specify these distinct phenotypes. Right? Or that could be maybe in a very simple world, in the simplest, most ideal world, maybe there is just a very small set, maybe even just one or two transcription factors that are sufficient to specify all neuron types. And really, this looks very unlikely, right? It looks very unlikely because, yes, I've told you, in an adult C. elegans neuron, in that specific example that I mentioned, there are 68 transcription factors expressed in the cell. Well, there's surely a lot of reason to believe that they all do uh, equally well some certain things to accept, right? Okay, so, so we tested these two models nevertheless and see, uh, see what is true here. And uh, that's where I want to just for two or three slides tell you a little bit about the experiments, how, how we do them so that you sort of uh, uh, grasp that. <clears throat> so the way we approach that problem is the following way. <clears throat> We've basically simply asked not on the level of transcription factors, but we have asked on the level of the non-coding part of the genome. We have asked what are the cis regulatory control mechanisms? What is the hidden regulatory content in genes that are expressed in a unique cell type? Right? And only when I give you the answer of what we found will it become clear what I mean. <clears throat> Basically, what we do is we take individual genes that are expressed in ASE. For example, this one neuron type, fuse into GFP. We look, they're expressed in AZ, and we identify minimal regulatory regions that are sufficient to drive expression in ASC. Right? And taking this very unbiased approach, we were very, and, and this is how it looks. I don't want to look into this, I just want to basically tell you there's a lot of work hidden. This is an entire you know, six years of work of a grad student to do this sort of stuff. So there's lots of experiments that go into this here. But here's a very simple bottom line. The very simple bottom line, bottom line is that all of the genes we looked at actually share the same cis regulatory motif. In a lot of those cases, we examined it experimentally, we find that this motif is absolutely required for expression of whatever gene we're looking at here in that specific neuron type. So these are the genes that, that for one particular specific neuron they need to be. And what you're saying is that that neuron hasn't been coded in that part of the sequence. That's right. them. So therefore, something attaches and turns them on. Exactly. Perfect. And what is this thing that attaches and turns it on? And again, this is sort of an experimental approach I want to convey to you. This is the beauty of C. elegans. And it's why we study C. elegans. We can screen for mutants in which specific stuff doesn't work anymore. And in this case, we're looking for mutants in which gene expression in ASE, visualized here with GFP, is gone. So that's somewhere that's a dark warm here. Uh, uh, maybe not. On the top of it. Okay. Oh yeah, here's one. Exactly. So here's one uh, where after we've treated these forms with mutants, they don't express GFP anymore, and that allowed us to identify a gene called Key one that indeed, if you zoom in, is required for the expression of all sorts of genes that are expressed normally in that neuron type. But the expression of those genes in other neuron types, like for example this neuron type here, is unaffected in that neuron type. Okay? And to cut a long story short, this turned out to be a transcription factor, a zinc finger transcription factor, that by this experimental approach here, we found to directly bind to this motif. Again, I'm telling you now 
this single transcription factor that co-regulates all of the different identity features of an individual neuron type. And even more miraculously, this transcription factor is exclusively expressed in the ASE neurons, the left and the right, the left and the right ASE neuron, from the time they're born in the embryo throughout adulthood. This transcription factor is uniquely expressed. So what I've told you here is that we actually don't see evidence for this mechanism where you have different transcription factors doing different stuff, but we rather have somebody who is more equal than others, so to speak, meaning a factor that is clearly more important for the specification of a neuron type than whatever other transcription factors are expressed in the specific neuron type. So a master regulatory control mechanism that specifies all of the different identity features of a neuron. And for every neuron or for one particular neuron? We'll go through all of the other neurons. Yes. <laughs> I just want to point out to you uh, uh, one similarity here uh, uh, um, of this co-regulatory uh, uh, control mechanism to something we've learned from classic bacterial and genetics is that biosynthetic pathways, for example, in bacteria and of course in us as well, in which we have multiple different enzymes that make uh, uh, out of a metabolite a specific end product, we've known for decades that these coupled biochemical events are also co-regulated by the same transcription factor. And what I'm telling you here is that neuronal identity works by a similar approach, even though those entities here are not biochemically linked, like they're in a biochemical pathway, but these are all different identity features of the neuron that do different things, but together define the identity of a neuron and are all co-regulated by the same transcription. Yes. So in the case of bacteria, isn't it more yeah. mm -hmm. no, isn't it more that there are operons? In other words, you would have just one, you know, they're all physically next to yeah. each other. It's it's just one. Th this is just the more uh, uh, the most extreme version of co-regulation. You have yeah. principal right. So uh, uh, often they come into operons, but even in those cases where they're operons, it's not the entire biosynthetic pathway. You have there are other parts of I see. And, and okay. this is actually that call, I have it here, no, I don't have it here. Uh, it's actually called a regulon. Right, right. So it's an old right. term from the bacterial genetics that's sort of superseding this sort of operon. Right. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, but now to your question, uh, uh, do we have now uh, uh, the possibility here of being something, of having something very simple here? 118 different neuron classes in C. elegans, 1,000 transcription factors. So could it be as simple as one transcription factor, by the way, we call these transcription factors terminal selectors because they select the final identity of a neuron. Do we simply have one terminal selector for one neuron class? Right? So in C. elegans, again, the numbers could work, right? 1,000 transcription factors, 118 neuron classes. But as soon as you go to more complex organisms, it's probably not going to work because the number of transcription factors in animal genomes. Uh, stays in that range. We, for example, we are, all of us, we have about 2,000 transcription factors encoded in our genome. But of course, many more cell types uh, than, than C. elegans has. So while this may work in C. elegans, it may not work in other uh, organisms. But does it even work in C. elegans that indeed every neuron has its own transcription factor? And I'll tell you, no. It's much more interesting. Before uh, I go into now asking uh, how other individual neuron types are specified, I need to take a step back and acknowledge to you uh, that no, we have not gone and taken out every single neuron in C. elegans and sequences transcript of. That's sort of the ideal thing uh, that one would want to have. And you know, of course, anyone, uh, uh, everyone is very excited about this possibility these days with single subsequence, and you've surely heard about this. Uh, uh, I hear that the entire Broad Institute has essentially uh, become a single cell sequencing center now, uh, uh, being really uh, keen on, uh, on mapping transcriptomes. It's very important. <coughs> so I want to uh, argue to you is uh, <coughs> that we actually don't need to go that far in Seattle's because we have an amazing resource that the community has built over the past 20 years that breathes life into this combinatorial coding scheme and that tells us a lot about individual neuron types 
and we don't really have to even do sequencing. And um, <clears throat> let me tell you what this resource is. Uh, this, the, the history of that resource is, of course, uh, Marty Chalfi, uh, also at Columbia, who uh, uh, brought GFP into the world of experimental biology, doing fluorescent protein. And ever since then, ever since 25 years ago almost or so, everyone in Sea Elegance who works on whatever, and we're talking thousands of people, when they have their favorite gene, they'll fuse it to GFP, and they make transgenic animals that express this GFP report. <coughs> this is sort of pulled out of the literature. There are many, many, many GFP reports. Right? What does it mean? That means that in practice, not everyone, but many C. elegans people, they really care. And they look, OK, what are these neurons? What is this? Thing? What is this new? They sit down and look and stare at it really hard, and they put it in their papers. And there are some people who manually curate papers, and this is what you come up with. We have essentially a repository of gene expression information composed of reporter genes for almost a thousand genes. And for those almost thousand genes, we know for each individual neuron in C. elegans, where that reporter gene is expressed. So for every single neuron here, there's a unique molecular signature. Right? This is totally unbiased, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in almost annoying way it's unbiased because people have not sat down and characterized some cells where there's only five reporter genes available for them. That's not very much. Would still make Anything. Let me tell you, you're not here. I can say anything I want about vertebrate neurologists now because I hope nobody's in the room. Uh, um, but if you work with the mouse nervous system <coughs> and uh, you study uh, development uh, of uh, individual neuron types in the mouse or even in the fly, you're really totally limited by the number of phenotypic features, meaning molecular markers, that you can study to ask how does a neuron acquire its unique identity. It's, it's a huge detriment uh, uh, to, uh, to this day to uh, understanding phenotypes, to really linking genotype to phenotype, that you have so limited phenotypic space, so to speak, to understand what is it, does it mean to be this or this or this neurotype in any system other than C. elegans. And C. elegans, again, as this num these numbers indi uh, indicate, we have an average, average 32 molecular markers, right, that allow us to classify individual neurons. Right. Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused about yes. the data. So when you say there's you know 5 to 141, 32 in the average, these are genes for which the experiment was done, and no. or the ones that where you got a signal with the set. Right. Was? So we have 1,000 genes yes. which were fused to GFP. People look where they, where they express them. Yes. And there are some cells that have so far only been found to express five of those reported genes. There's some other cells where we have 140 markers for them. So the zeros are really zeros. They're not unknowns. I mean, in other words, we know that yes. the rest were. Okay, that's what I want. Yeah. Okay. Very important. Okay, that's what I want. These are real zeros. Real, okay, that's, that was the question. Yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> yes. So that actually that seems a bit weird to me. How does a neuron have 141 and one have five? Like you can't. It seems you couldn't have a cell with only five genes. I'm totally not saying that. Okay. Right? So this is only. One thousand reporters okay. out of whatever seventeen thousand genes. Right? right. Reporter genes also inherently means that you only take part of the gene and fuse it to GFP, so you're missing regulatory information. Right. But you still have totally right to ask. You know why isn't this more equally distributed here? And that is where a little bit of bias does come in. Right. For example, traditionally, you have people that have been very uh, interested in uh, looking at uh, sensory receptors. Right. So lots and lots of people have made GFP fusions to GPCR type sensory receptors that express in sensory neurons. Those guys that have more than 100, they're all sensory neurons. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are other totally stupid reasons, which is um, uh, some neurons are simply um, hard to identify. What I mean by that is if some brand groups if some random lab <coughs> makes a GFP reporter and sees, okay, there are two cells, 
uh, that's pretty easy to identify, but sometimes if you have multiple cells here, or there are some cells somewhere located in the middle of the brain where you, it's hard to be confident that your gene is expressing that cell. Right. And those tend to be the, uh, the, uh, the cells for which we have a few genes. Left. So it's a stupid bias that is no reflection of real biology. So in that case, the zero is already zero. Because no, the zero, zero is zero. The zero is zero for those guys where we know the expression pattern. Yeah, but when you said when they're like... Uh, this doesn't count. So okay. the, this is actually, uh, 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 believe it or not, I manually hand curated that. I went through the papers and sort of confirmed for those guys that are, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, so has do I trust these people, right, uh, or not? And I really, it, it's a very personal bias and it's very annoying to computational people. Uh, who try to use this data set because they of when they come to me and ask me so how did you curate this data set? I read the papers. I'm sorry, I cannot help you any more than doing. You know, it's it's data that's not easy to mine. Right? Let's put it this way. Now that we have this very useful data for for us and hopefully others. Okay, so what I want to convey now to you is that this is a molecular atlas that we can now use, not just for this one neuron type that I just told you about, where we identify what is the cis to information content that makes those genes express that neuron type. We can do that for other neurons as well. The same type of approach. I won't bother you with primary data, I'll just say, here's another neuron. We did the same thing. We identified what are the cis regulatory motifs required in those genes to be expressed in that neuron type. Again, there was a simple motif present in all of those guys. And then again, we identified transcription factors that are required for the expression of all the genes that are specific to this one neuron type AI. Yes? Um, so I guess. As a clinic, going to what you were saying before, if, yeah. you had, if you only have a thousand, and especially with this mm -hmm. five to one forty-one mm -hmm. issue, you could say that this is enough for you, like as a scientist, to identify these neurons, but not necessary. But this identity is not necessarily the one that the biology is picking up on, because it could be in those other. Absolutely. Genes. Okay. It could be. It could be. It's. It's. It, it, this. Yes, you're right. There are intrinsic okay. limitations to that data set, and obviously we want to improve it. Right. But for the types of conclusion that I'll draw today, and I hope I'll come into it at the end of the talk, that even yeah. this sort of limited space right, allows us to, to generalize what we have found for some neurons to apply to other neurons. But well. I think a key question there is that you covered all the transcription factors, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll come to that. I see. Yes. Okay, because that's the key, right? If you don't have something else, it doesn't matter. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so I want to, you know, now it's sort of uh, impress on you a very important principle that came out when we looked at other neuron types. So the short uh, uh, punchline is that this one transcription factor defining one neuron type is the exception. What is rather the rule is that you have combinations of transcription factors that work together in neuron type specific in a neuron type specific manner. And here's what I mean by that. Here's a transcription factor that is expressed in a bunch of different neuron types. Here's a transcription factor, again, expressed in a different type of neurons. Their expression uniquely overlaps in this one neuron. And each of these transcription factors is absolutely essential for the specification of that neuron. This transcription factor is also required for this and this neuron, but there it's presumably working with other code factors. But in this neuron, it works together with this guy. And working together means biochemically something very specific without taking you through the detail. The bottom line is only if you have both transcription factors together can they bind this cis regulatory motif and activate AI specific genes, genes that are specifically expressed in that neuron. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a unique combinatorial combination of transcription factors that specify that specific. Yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. The the binding, so they're binding, they're competing for binding to the same. Not competing. I remember we talked a little bit about phage lambda last time. This is phage lambda. This is combinatorial. This is cooperative binding to DNA. One cannot bind without the other factor. They're part of the machinery. 
Yeah. So there, okay, there are lemma rights in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is where TKC binds, this is where CT binds. Ah, ah. Next one. Yeah. Okay. So basically, from here on, it's mostly now schematics. <clears throat> basically, we used now this molecular map to do the same <coughs> thing as what I've described to you before. We used genetic screens for mutants in which specific molecular markers appear to be expressed. Once we had a mutant, we then looked for the other markers for that specific neuron type and asked whether they're expressed. So we did this a lot. Right? This is sort of summarizing what we've done over the last many years. And this theme that I just told you held out very beautifully. Meaning, it's not the case that you have individual transcription factors for all individual neuron types, but individual neuron types require specific combinations of transcription factors to be specified. Let me take you through this. Here's a neuron type called the AIDS gene. For it to, uh, to uh, acquire its unique molecular signature, measured by, you know, in some cases we have looked at lots of molecular markers, in other cases we only had a few markers available, we only looked at a few markers. But this transcription factor is required for all of the molecular features we tested for that neuron, and this factor also is. Right? So those two factors collaborate to specify that neuron type, but in this neuron type, this guy now works with somebody else with another transcription factor, and those presumably bind to a different target gene in that sequence to activate the expression of different sets of genes. Okay? And I want you to point out here, but to, to see here that this combination means you have actually a much smaller number of transcription factors. You don't actually even need 118 different transcription mm -hmm. factors. You have a smaller set of transcription mm -hmm. factors that come together in unique combinations to specify neural identity. Now, there's some in the audience here who say, wait, wait, wait a second, there's some non-unique combinations here, right? And there are, here, what you need. That simply means we've been lazy, right? <laughs> we haven't yet been able uh, to look at other cofactors here, but again, we would very clearly predict on this and other data that I'll show you in a second, that we may find unique combinations for every single neuron type. And I'll come back to that, to that theme later on, when it becomes more interesting for you in terms of maybe modeling and more quantitatively analyzing the data. Okay, so, so again, so basically what I'm telling you here is that this unique combination of effector genes that define a terminally differentiated state are again defined by combinatorial codes, but these are combinatorial codes of transcription factors. Right? We have unique combinations of transcription factors that come together in the cell to activate a unique combination of effector genes. Everything above here, you can infinitely, well not infinitely, but from here you can go to the fertilized egg in the sense that, well, this combination here of transcription factors in that neuron type is presumably specified by some upstream layer of signals and other transcription factors that are expressed in that neuron type and so forth and so forth. That's developmental biology that we don't care about. We care about this step here, the terminal differentiation of neurons, right? Again, unique combination of transcription factors to the job. I want to sidetrack a little bit here, just for two slides, and tell you what that exactly means on the level of those genes that I've already discussed with you. I've told you about genes that are expressed in a specific neuron type, and I've told you that they have individual cis regulatory motifs that direct their expression to specific what this here, of course, predicts is that every individual gene in the genome that is expressed in specific patterns in the nervous system is organized in a modular manner in the sense that it may have binding sites of some transcription factors that are activated in one cell, a different set of transcription factors in other cells, and so forth and so on. That's a prediction. And that's very clearly what we see. If we take a gene, very important gene that is uh, specifying to, uh, whether you use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. It's expressed 38 different neuron types. And if you take individual parts of that upstream regulatory region, fuse it to GFP, you see that different parts specify expression in different subset of neurons. Right? So any given gene that is expressed in, in complex patterns in the nervous system contains a modular set 
of cis-regulatory elements that respond to the neuron type specific combinations of transcription factors. So that's a basic regulatory structure of neuronal identity control. Right? You have factor genes that integrate neuron type specific combinations of transcription factors. But I really want to go now to the whole system. <clears throat> I want to now tell you that uh, um, <clears throat> we're not just you know, monkeys doing the same thing <coughs> over and over again, again because we know how to do it. Uh, yes, we do engage in monkey-like activities in the sense that we do things over and over again, but we actually have a very specific thought and idea behind it, which is if we look at enough neuronal specification events to re reveal more organizational principles or themes by which these transcription factors are employed. Right? And that's what I want to discuss with you for the rest of the talk and, and move into, uh, into the connect talk, essentially. I want to first again show you a table that's a little hard to digest. It's a big table, but it's really destroying exactly what I showed you before in a slightly more abstract way. I'm showing you here <coughs> all of the 86 different neuron classes in CFNs for which we know transcription factors that specify their identity. These transcription factors are listed up here. Whenever you see a colored box, that means that transcription factor specifies <coughs> the identity of that new. Like for example, you see here, uh, let's take this guy here. This transcription factor works together with this transcription factor to specify that specific neuron type. And the very same transcription factor uh, uh, is employed elsewhere, but in combinations, like in this case, very same transcription factor as this guy, but now working together with this transcription factor to specify the identity of another neuron type. So this is the data set that we have, and that we're still building on expanding, but it's matured long enough, uh, 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 far enough that we're asking what are sort of, what are the hidden mess messages, so to speak, in such a diagram? I've told you already about two of them. I've told you about this master regulatory theme that these transcription factors don't just specify one aspect of the identity, they specify the entire identity, entire cohort of phenotypes. And I've told you that these reiteratively used combinations of distinct transcription factors that come together in your types of different ways, but are there more themes hidden here? So, sorry, in, yes. In, in the, before, when we're looking at the specific genes, you said we still don't know what the transcription factors were. But in this map, and I can't just look at it and be sure, mm -hmm. uh, although I think I just answered the question when I did, there is no, is there a one to oneness? I mean, do we have a complete? No. Even on this? We have to finish it. Okay. And I'll, I'll come to that in a few slides. This has to be the goal. The prediction of what we have and everything we've seen so far is. That at the end of the day, we will have unique combinatorial codes for every single neural type. I wouldn't have made this prediction a couple of years ago, but based on what we're having so far, if it moves further in sort of the way it has gone so far, we will have unique combinations. But again, I come to that again. <coughs> Do they always come in pairs? No, it can be. Uh, uh, but a good question. Uh, uh, oh, there's three. So there's three here. There's one case um, that my former postdoc just published uh, two weeks ago. It's five. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I put it in. I don't think put it in yet. Um, so uh, no, it's there's no clear uh, theme in terms of, and, and that has to do with how these transcription factors biochemically interact. It's very hard to predict, but it's more than two in some cases. Sorry, just so, yes. uh, so you pointed out that in many of these cases they actually cooperatively serve yes. to okay, but that doesn't need to be the case. So No it doesn't. Absolutely not. And there are some cases where we explicitly know that they don't cooperatively work, that there are in one case we have three different transcription factors, uh, uh, and they bind to very different sites that are very distal from the right. And each transcription factor is only partially required. So it's like the promoter is adding up the regulatory information in a only the binding of all three leads to full activation of the gene. Yes? Um, have you looked into this in terms of a hierarchical organization of cell types? So, you know, the, the 118 um, categories is just the, yeah. the organic distribution of cells. Can I come to that? 
come back to this in a few slides. Never forget, uh, remind me again, please. The bottom line is yes, you can also hierarchically cluster. Well, okay. well, and can you go down too? So, for example, differentiating the left and right uh, cells within the class. Do you find more classes based on transcription factor expression profiles so far? Not yet. Based on the factor genes, yes. If, I, if, you, if you had asked me this question beforehand, where I showed you the whole thing of all the reporter genes, if we were to hierarchy cluster that, which we have, uh, you can actually recover more than 118 neuron class, which is a reflection of some of these neuron classes being subdivided into uh, subtypes, including left-right subtypes, for example. But I think more than just the hierarchical organization, is there like a systematic uh, combinatorial structure to how the trans um, the, the elements are expressed? So can you exchange elements or switch elements around? To move uh, can we discuss it afterwards? I'll, I want to show you a different theme first, and maybe it's not really answering your question, but maybe it satisfies you in different ways. So mindful of yeah, we could, could just hold questions to the end unless it's absolutely necessary to move forward. So there's only 15 minutes left, and I, I feel like there's lots more story to come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right, so are there themes? <clears throat> the first theme that I want to point out to you, which sounds like, you know, this is only a stupid transcription factor person would do that, going totally off about one specific class of transcription factors, but I think it's very important. So, I'm telling you that those transcription factors that specify neuronal identity are mostly of the class of homodomain transcription factors. And I think this is very important, as I'll again show you, because I think it tells us something about uh, uh, evolution of neuronal identity and also evolution of circuitry. So far, hold your thought, just remember there's one class of transcription factors here that predominates the regulatory landscape, if you will. There are others. But if you look at this table really hard, you can see that whenever there is a non homodomain transcription factor, they are uh, usually works together with homodomain transcription factor. Um, I will go over this background here, uh, and I will just tell you that homodomain transcription factors are not simply the most prevalent class of transcription factors, and that's why they are so frequently used. They make up in total only 10% of all transcription factors in any animal gene. Yet they totally predominate the landscape of neuronal identity control. And again, I'll tell you later, we think that means something. I do want to point out here, <coughs> again, I said this before, of those 86 neuron classes color-coded here, for which we know regulatory factors, 76 of them utilize on their own stream. When this became clear to us, we started to more systematically look at homeobox gene expression patterns, irrespective of function. We just looked at expression patterns. And we found that, in fact, all of the neurons in CLS can be uniquely uh, express a homeobox gene, and most of them express unique combinations of homeobox genes. Once we've looked at all homeobox genes, which we haven't done yet, Again, the very clear prediction on, based on these numbers is that every single neuron type in C elements will be defined by the combinatorial expression of the homeobox gene. Coming back at these single cell sequencing efforts, in vertebrates, it's a big deal for people to classify neuron types. Right? And again, huge efforts are being spent in doing that by looking at Excel spreadsheets of uh, sequence cells and look, uh, are there combinatorial codes that uniquely define neuron types? I've shown you something like that. But I'm basically telling you, hey, we may not have to go that far. If we look at specific classes of genes, such as homeobox genes, we may have unique molecular identifiers of neuronal identity without going deep and finding all of the genes that may be regulated by these combinations of homeobox transcription. Okay, so we're continuing this, but now I finally want to get into the theme uh, of, that is hidden here that we are most excited about. And this is a, a, a theme that results from the following question. I've told you already repeatedly that what's hidden in here is the reusage of the same transcription factors in the context of different combinations. 
Here's a guy that is used in 13 different neuron classes in different combinations. Here's a guy that is used again in 13 different neuron classes and so forth and so forth. So the question is, do all these transcription factors, which are most of them, that are utilized again and again, does this reusage of a given transcription factor in different neuron types tell us something about those neuron types? And at first sight, it does not, right? Look at these, uh, look at this guy here. <coughs> this, is, this transcription factor specifies sensory neurons, interneurons, motor neurons. These different colors mean different neurotransmitter identities. So these are very different neuron types. They're all specified by the same transcription factor. One combination with others, right? But is there nevertheless a theme that is shared by all of those neurons? And the answer is in the next slide. And particularly to this audience, I don't need to really explain that slide. And it's something that really excited us a lot when we saw that first, and the answer is here. This is an example, again, of a homeobox transcription factor. It is expressed in all of those neurons. It is required to specify the identity of all of those neurons based on the molecular markers I told you about. And look, all of those neurons are synaptically connected. And these actually happen to be neurons on which uh, several people had done work on. This is a, a reflex circuitry. Not all of these neurons have been implicated in this reflex circuitry, but this neuron surely had this neuron and uh, those neurons in the center here and those neurons down here. Meaning, you throw something nasty onto worms, they'll back up and they'll engage neurons of that circuit. Here's another circuit. I lifted that straight from the old connecton paper, from the right old connecton paper. It's a so called motor circuit. Here are all the commanded neurons, here are all the uh, motor neurons. All of those guys are cholinergic, and they all require this one transcription factor on three to be specified. And look, all of these neurons, except this one nasty class, which is very different and strange, uh, um, all of these neurons are synaptically connected to one another and require the same transcription factor. Here's a particularly extreme case. Look at this thing here. So this is a transcription factor <coughs> that uh, specifies the entire pharyngeal nervous system. The pharyngeal nervous system is a little bit of a, 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 of a weird nervous system that's sort of like our enteric nervous system. It's isolated from the rest from the central nervous system. It's a bunch of interconnected neurons of different types. Every single one of these neurons requires this one homey box transcription factor C34. And again, we think it acting with different partners and different cells to make these neurons become different from one another and specify how they exactly interconnect with one another. But again, the unifying theme of the activity of that one transcription factor is all of those guys are synaptically connected. So obviously what I'm insinuating here is that these transcription factors don't just specify uh, identity of a neuron in terms of some molecular markers, but these transcription factors also are required to assemble neurons into circuitry. Right? That's something that we're looking uh, into right now. I just want to give you one example here that tells you that this is looking very promising. <coughs> we looked at unfree mutant animals, took EM data that was collected by John White more than 30 years ago of those mutant animals. And let's look at this one neuron here. We have all the en passant synapses in the one wild-type animal that was ever looked at. I had mentioned nerve cords, and here's the mutant. Most of these synaptic contacts are gone. Right? Let's get a little bit more complicated now, because uh, as you know better than anyone else, uh, 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 the connectome is, of course, not just a collection of individual isolated circuits anatomically. Anatomically is essentially sort of a hairball, right? Everything is interconnected in smart and interesting ways, but how does that relate to our, uh, 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 or to my statement that I just made that individual circuits are defined by the expression of transcription factors? <coughs> well, let's expand this a little bit, what I told you. <coughs> Here's one transcription factor that specifies motor circuitry. And again, the underlying uh, uh, hypothesis here is that this transcription factor works with different cofactors in different subsets of these neurons. And for one, actually, we know what the cofactor is. 
it's a transcription factor that again is expressed in a partially overlapping set of neurons that are also synaptically connected to one another. Right? So the way <coughs> we're thinking about this is you can isolate, based on expression pattern and connectivity, these, we're going to use a term here, these OR circuits maybe, right? ancestral circuits maybe, specified by the same transcription factor. They're different ones, right? But they overlap. And that's how, at the end of the day, you come up with a more hairball type connectome and how green here means a circuit transcription factor that specifies one circuit working together with this transcription factor that defines these other connected neurons. And that they two both together now specify the unique connectivity of that one neuron. And that brings me now to my last slide, <coughs> before I summarize, <coughs> and brings me back to this uh, uh, statement that I made before about homeobox genes being so prevalent in the landscape of, of regulatory factors that specify a neuron by day. That must mean something, right? And as, uh, as uh, good old uh, Theo told us here, <coughs> nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I'm sure every one of you has heard this statement. And I, I love to uh, apply to what I've told you today about, maybe this prevalence of homeobox genes tells us that perhaps literally just by chance, the very first cell in the metazoan organism where individual cell types specialized, and where one cell type specialized to adopt the ability to uh, sense environmental stimuli, and in response, send a signal to, let's say, the my myoepithelial cell that could contract, and thereby give what was before just a, a, a single cell layer of a, of a very simple organism, uh, individual cell types. Maybe that was a homeobox gene that did that, in the sense that this homeobox gene may have just controlled a receptor and some signaling molecule, glutamate receptor that senses amino acids in the environment, and uh, an enzyme that makes a different signal uh, uh, in response to stimulation by this extracellular the signal, right? And maybe things then just grew, meaning duplicated, you got more of the same. Meaning signaling cells that were still very similar to one another, specified by the same transcription factor, and one of the things that this transcription factor may have specified is the expression of synaptic adhesion molecules. Simply homophilic molecules that glued some of these neurons together, right? So you get sort of a nervous, a nerve net, so to speak, where stimulation at whatever cell in this net transmitted the signal throughout the entire nerve net. And after that, that's of course a key driving force of every, any evolutionary process, you duplicate and diversify, right? Meaning you get more homeobox genes, they, you know, by simple gene duplication events, they may have biochemically somewhat diverged to now control different sets of target genes. And maybe those neurons now connected in different ways to one another. And then uh, everything after that, after getting these sort of core circuits specified by different, but still related, phylogenetically related, only the main conception factors, everything after that may have just, just been an addition and interconnectivity of these ancestral circuits here specified by all the students. So that's the hypothesis uh, that we have. Like any hypothesis in evolution that's uh, uh, um, difficult to prove on an evolutionary timescale, of course, uh, approach, of course, would be to look at different uh, organisms, different nematodes, and that's something of the things that we, or simpler nervous systems which don't really exist, but that's something we can discuss afterwards. Let me, let me finish here by relaying again the key points to you. <coughs> Individual neurons in the nervous system are defined by this master regulatory mechanism. Uh, and this master regulatory uh, 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 mechanism entails these terminal selective transcription factors that are used again and again, but in different combinations. They are primarily uh, homeobox genes, <coughs> uh, and their reutilization may relate to the fact that uh, these neurons may share some evolutionary history in the sense that they may have brought neurons uh, together uh, 
an evolutionary context, and maybe also in a developmental context to the state to specify uh, uh, individual neuron circuits. And uh, thanks to all the people who did the work, there's lots of people involved in that, uh, and uh, that is the goal here. Thanks for your attention. This was very inspiring for me, so I'm going to hold up the questions because I will have the chances to talk to me. So, anyone, go for it. It's okay. I just want questions. So, I'm, um, I'm, I'm sort of trying to understand the mechanism. By the way, fascinating. One of the most interesting talks I ever heard. Anyway, um, the um, I, I'm trying to understand the synaptic connections between two particular types of neurons and how they arise. Now, you said there may be particular molecules that get, you know. But somehow, you know, there's the, the axons are growing and they sort of target somebody, there's some chemotaxis presumably involved or something. So how does that fit this, what you just talked about? I'm sort of missing the connection with that mechanism. You are having, unfortunately, a too complicated view of the nervous system development. At the end of the day, the C. elegans nervous system and other nervous systems, very likely as well, the simple nervous system, Make synapses en passant. What that simply means is you don't have to worry about how action outputs. I mean, that obviously happens. But at the end of the day, the decision points are much simpler. The decision points lie in a bundle of processes where you have lots of processes that parallel one another, and you have to choose in that bundle to which one of my neighbors do I make a connection to. So it's conceptually a pretty simple problem that can be solved by a very limited number of molecular tags. So you know, my own speculation that you know, the original EM people write it all, they already uh, uh, proposed that. So again, all of these neurons, they send out the process into a thick, fat bundle, right? And once they're in that bundle, they decide, okay, what are the neighbors that I make connections to? But, but as, do we know the molecular signatures corresponding to each pair? I mean, that's, yeah, no, uh, it's one of the dirty secrets of, uh, uh, of neurobiology that uh, uh, synaptic recognition molecules and the mechanism, there are, of course, some very prominent, important examples, isolated examples in the visual system of the fly, in the neuromuscular system, but there's no coherent logic yet okay. where one could say, look, here's a class, like with the homeobox genes, you know, here's a class of synaptic adhesion molecules, and all I need is sort of invent some combinatorial code there is no unifying theory yet, not even theory, there's theory for a long time, chemo affinity uh, hypothesis, uh, um, but there's no molecular tool set right, that allows us to really explain yet differential connectivity. All I'm saying is it can be pretty simple, but still hasn't been figured out. Have a follow-up with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that means actually that, that, that who is trying to connect to whom has to recognize the signatures of that, right? And That's that right. has to be somehow controlled by the transcription factor. Absolutely. Of He's going to connect. Absolutely. To, right? So, Absolutely. so there has to be that complementarity. And that, that combination which has not been worked out. So, so what you explain us is that there is a good uh, transcriptomics for the identity of the neurons, but then how this neuron will recognize the other one as saying, yes, I'm supposed to connect, or no, you stink and I'm not going to connect right. to you, right? That has not been worked out. So it we know the nodes, but not the edges. So yes. But I, we're doing that now. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to talk to people like this who we'll ask these sort of questions because it relates to me really the urge. I mean, it's pretty obvious, but you know, we need to be kicked into the every once in a while. I mean, what we really need to do, there's only 120 or so transmembrane proteins encoded in the genome that have extracellular uh, protein protein interaction. It's only 120. That's not very much, but can combinatorially give you anything you want. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Right? So, what we need to do, nobody has done that yet systematically. We really have to do that is to map their expression profiles. And again, the prediction would be that those guys should be the molecular tags that define the specificity. But some of them are already mapped out in the 900, right? Some of them are. But not everything, right? Not so you just say, a small so subset of the rest of it and just do the same thing as well. I see, okay. Well, that's interesting, okay. Uh, somewhat along those same lines, you haven't said very much about neurotransmitter specific uh, synapses uh, and receptors. Uh, so, uh, do you have any correlations with that? Totally. Yeah. 
and that was actually hidden here. I didn't emphasize it. Actually, usually the talks that I give are totally focused actually about neurotransmitter identity. That's, I, that I use it as, a, as an entry point for studying neural identity. That's where I, how I often start. But this is a color code here. So the color code means, look, here's a transcription factor that specifies yellow, glutamatergic neurons, cholinergic neurons, this is a peptidergic neuron, this is a serotonergic neuron. Right? And again, these neurons assemble into a circuit. If you're just understanding my question, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you point out that all the, that, that where the homeobox is expressed, uh, yeah. everything tends to be connected to everything else. Yeah. But they're not all using the same neurotransmitter. They're, they're, they're absolutely not. Yeah. Sure. So the, that, that, there, there's more to be said than just to connect them. That, that's absolutely right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It does not track with neurotransmitter. Yes. It does not. It does not track or correlate. Connected within any given circuit, we get a great diversity of, uh, of neurotransmitters. So that's not a new one. That's right. And, and it's not true that they're all connected. It's just that you do have connectivity within each of those modules that are specified by one of these transcriptions. Absolutely right. And, and your hypothesis is that every bit of pattern that you have within each model could still be worked out by looking at the overlaps? Yes, yes. So that's, yes, yes. All right, last question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a meta question. Yes. Uh, so uh, obviously one would like to make a quantum jump into mm -hmm. brains of, you know, yeah. vertebrates and whatever. So uh, one of the, you know, because this goes back to what I said about development and finding your mm -hmm. partners. So there's a lot of plasticity in the mm -hmm. human brain. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know about precisely what I was talking about, you mm -hmm. know, neurons, you know, axons finding partners. And so, so the question, I guess, is what are the fundamental differences between C. elegans that we know, between C. elegans and advanced quote-unquote brains in terms of things like plasticity, learning, uh, what can we say about... I, it's a stupid one, question one in some sense, but I, but I want to like... One word, four letters. Sorry? None. <laughs> None, no similarities at all. No, no, no differences. No, no differences. No, no <laughs> so wait, wait, but there's so there, so so how does learning happen? Because there's no rewiring in the case of the CLN. No, so. I've never said this. Oh, I this is great. Of no, no, oh, no, oh, oh, good point. This is, you're, you're raising a you know a can of worms. <laughs> uh, you open a can of worms. Uh, uh, there's lots of plas synaptic plasticity in the in the system, and I want to just very briefly tell you about how that. I mean, so first of all, everything that vertebrates, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of synaptic plasticity, memory alert, they can do associative learning. It's thought to also go via synaptic strengthening and so forth. Uh -huh. How does this relate to what I'm pretending? to be in a totally hardwired transcription exactly. factor right. deterministic system. Well, actually, we have some very nice examples for when we think how that works. What these transcription factors do is, they set a ground truth. They set the potential for connectivity. Right? You superimpose onto that something that modulates synaptic activity. Could be in the context of synapse uh, of uh, learning. It could be in the response to environmental stimuli. It could be in response to sexual maturation. You know, different sex have different connectivity patterns. And in those cases where we've been studying them, it's very beautiful, very clear. Those terminal selectors operate together with a condition-specific transcription factor that promotes or there inhibits their activity. Condition-specific. Here's one example. There is a specific uh, stimulus, hypoxia, right? Very bad thing. What that does, it rewires a chemosensory circuit in the womb. What we have found is that a hypoxia inducible transcription factor works together with the resident terminal selectors of a specific neuron type to enforce this rewiring. Neither alone is sufficient to do it. You require the hardwired routine, alone not sufficient to do it, together with the third transcription factor that is condition specific, in this case, hypoxia inducible, and only then do you have the proper combination to now specify a different molecular phenotype onto a neuron. But where is this in these pictures that you're drawing? Uh, it would be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 
you have now uh, under a specific stimulus uh, an additional connection being made here. This specific connection, I would predict, based on what we know in other systems, that it would require this transcription factor for this connection to even be thought about, so to speak, right? But then it requires yet another factor that works right. together with this guy to make this connection. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you. This was fabulous. Thank you.